that Lord you would come in power in this place this morning. We need to hear from you. Lord, we thank you that you're a God who speaks today. Amen. And you're a God who is concerned for your people. Yes. And you're a God who loves your people, Lord. You are passionate for your people. Lord, you established the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against your church. And we are here as your church today. Lord, I want to pray that, Lord, you would give us an indication, uh, an understanding of how great a thing the church of Jesus Christ is. That we are the most important organisation on the face of the planet. And I just want to pray as I speak these words today that, Lord, they would not be my words, but that you would speak through me this morning. I pray that you would, Lord, energise, that you would, Lord, uh, excite, that you would, Lord, uh, raise up, Lord, something within your people, that you would fill us with a passion for following you. So I pray the Holy Spirit would come this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Great, okay. Well, I uh, just want to give you a really, really big thank you. Everybody who took place in our Blitz Day yesterday. A lot of people who took, play, took part in it yesterday who aren't here today. But we did have a really fantastic day yesterday. We've got loads of stuff done. Just to give you an indication of what was done, we stripped all the old carpet out of the top. Everything was hoovered and wiped down. So we wanted to just get the dust levels down in the church. And doesn't it smell fresher this morning? I think it just, it's, it's got a freshness about it. Also, we, uh, uh, well, the guys cut down the trees at the side, which were becoming a little bit overgrown and a little bit of an obstacle, so they were taken down. Uh, we've still got some stuff to clear out. The bulk of the work has been done, so I want to thank, thank the guys for that. And also, we, we put uh, the banners up outside the church, uh, which is kind of a statement to our town that we are very much in business and we are very much following Jesus Christ. Uh, so, so uh, unfortunately, she almost tore one a little bit, but we, uh, we'll, we'll repair that. I, I didn't expect that, to be honest, but I think as we do this more, and we put more and more of these things up, and we kind of change things at the front, and let people see what's happening, that it becomes a norm then, and then people don't kind of want to uh, abuse it as much. But we uh, pray over those signs at the front, we don't want them uh, damaged anymore. So, um, so I uh, just wanted to just give you a huge, huge thank you. Uh, now, it might not look, but all, uh, it might look as though there's not a lot different in the church, but I want to tell you, things are different today as a result of all uh, everyone's efforts yesterday. Things are really different, and uh, we've done a lot of stuff. And, uh, you know, of course, it's a process, because we're, there's not many of us here, and it will take time for us to kind of get things painted and get things looking smarter outside and... Uh, just you know, get things uh, get get things moving. So it will, it will take time, but it's a start, and uh, I really believe that God will honour it. Um, I've mentioned that uh, James has been nominated to stand as a deacon. I think that's healthy for the church. I think when people are asked to stand, it's a healthy thing. Uh, we have a constitution that allows people to be nominated, so it's a healthy thing, and it's nothing to be nothing for anyone to. Uh, think well, you know, there's about no confidence in the leadership team or anything like that. We've only been here six weeks. I mean, you've got no confidence in me anyway, so it doesn't make any difference. But you know, it's uh, yeah, you know, it's a good thing. It's a healthy thing, and of course, uh, it's it's part of our our, our church structure and organisation. So God's going to bless that. Now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit in the sermon about this, but I've, I've been in to see um, Martin Wise at the high school in uh, Hollyhead. Uh, so there's some things I'm going to mention there which are quite exciting in my sermon as we move on as kind of illustrations to what we're talking about today. So just by, um, so let's, let's get started, Joe. Just by way of introduction, we're carrying on uh, uh, our theme, Amos in Crazy Times. As you know, we've been looking at the book of Amos. We've been think, saying to ourselves, asking ourselves week in, week out, what has the book of Amos got to say to us today? It's an ancient book. Um, but I believe there are some key things in there that we can learn from as a church and that will help us in our walk with Jesus. So that's what we're doing. We're continuing that theme. Now this week, we're at our halfway point. We, we, we're doing part seven this week. It, it's going to take us 14 weeks, as I said. Uh, so we're at, at part seven. We reached the halfway mark in this series, which is good because we've only got seven more to go. Everyone's saying, praise the Lord. <laughs> but uh, we've got seven more weeks to go. And... Um, and uh, it's the halfway point today. Now this week, what, what we're going to do, we're going to move on and we're going to look at the first of two messages. They're called woe messages 
or they're, they're described as woe messages. You know, like when Jesus said, you know, he, he was having a go at the leaders of this day, the religious leaders, and he says, woe to you, woe to you. And he's, he's basically telling them what's wrong. Well, there, there are two woe messages in, in this book, and uh, everyone's like, oh, whoa. It's not very funny, that, is it? So, uh, <laughs> there's two, two woe messages, and uh, uh, I just want to say that what we need to understand about the book of Amos is that within this book we have a series of messages that would have uh, been delivered to the leaders and to the people of Israel possibly over a two year period. So this guy called Amos, he's a farmer, he's going telling the people what's wrong, he's going telling the leaders what's wrong, he's a bit of a radical, he's a bit out on the edge, uh, but it took him about two years to deliver these messages. and. Uh, what we need to understand about the book of Amos is that Amos' teaching, Amos' ministry, was not one block of ministry, it was not one block of teaching, it was a series. Like we've gone through this, this book in, in series, haven't we? It was a series. So within the passage, what we, what we have is what seems to be a lot of repetition. Repetition of, of, of different themes and different issues that God needed to address in the lives of his people to bring transformation to the nation and to their situation. So we see repetition. Now, in our lives, right, before, before we knew Jesus, uh, before we had a, a relationship with God, in order to help us to start living in a right way, the Holy Spirit, for me, before I was a Christian, began to point things out in my life that were not helpful to me. And it would have been the same for you guys as well. That's what the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a spirit of conviction. It's, it convicts us in love, but it says, come on Dave, you know, these issues are not right in your life. You need to deal with them. So over a series of time, uh, the Holy Spirit pointed out things to me and to you guys that weren't helpful. Now, when we became Christians, we thought everything was sorted and everything was all right. But then, a, a, maybe a couple of months or a couple of years after we, we, we started following Jesus, well, normally a couple of months, God starts to point things out again. Areas that he needs to see change in, in our lives. And what happened after we became Christians was uh, when we were led to Jesus, the Holy Spirit again began or begins to start pointing out things that are binding us. And, and certainly in our lives, there's a lot of things that bind us. There's a lot of things that we need to break free of. Yeah? And of course, God, because he loves us and he wants to use us and he wants us to be in fullness in our relationship and in our life with him, he'll break that stuff away. He'll start smashing it away and he'll keep pointing it out, pointing it out until we get the point that that thing in our life needs to change. Um, what God does, he shows us the cross. He shows us that Jesus, perfect, without sin, was completely crucified, butchered by men, died on a cross, so that we could also be, we, we could break free, break free from the stuff in our lives through his sacrifice on the cross. Because when Jesus died, everything that we've ever done wrong, past, present and future, was completely broken away. Now we've got a choice, we can either stay in the situation we're in, or we can choose to take those things to Jesus and have them broken from us, torn from us, taken from us, so that we start to run, so that we start to move in a way that uh, God wants us to move. We start to move in the spirit, we start to move in life. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that says, he, he came that we would have life, and have life in all its fullness, and that's what happens. The blockages are taken away and we start living this life and it starts getting excited and amazing things start to happen and we see amazing things happen in the lives of other people and, and then other people start seeing amazing things and other people get saved, other people Amen. find Jesus because that's what it's all about. It's about blockages, yes. it's about things being broken and taken from our lives, things being cut away, Amen. yeah? But until those issues are sorted out, as I've said, the Holy Spirit lovingly points to those things again and again until we realise 
that we cannot deal with these things alone. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. And that's why we see what seems to be a lot of re repetition in Moses' book, Moses' prophecy uh, to the nation of Israel. Yeah? Because Amos, through God, uh, God, God, through Amos, needed to point some stuff out again and again and again to the nation of Israel until the, the, the leaders got it, until change was embraced, until people were released from the freedom and the bondage that they were caught up in. Does everyone get that? It's good stuff, isn't it? And I want God to point stuff out in my life. I want God to completely keep putting his finger on things because I want to be free. God's made me to be free. God's made each one of us in here to be free. And you know, I want to tell you that being free in Jesus and living a life full of freedom is the most incredible thing because God begins to give us things he wants us to do for him. Exciting things he wants us to do for him. So it's a thing of point those things out until we give them to Jesus and until we're free. It's repetition. It's sorted out. Yeah? And I really feel for Amos because as I've been preaching this series, I've thought I'm preaching the same things every week. But you see, Amos, he, you know, he had to go and deliver it to the nation. And it was the same things, like, not all the same things, because obviously, as we've been doing this series, lots of different issues have come out, and that's God's word. If we study it kind of holistically, you know, like a, book, a whole book like this, we see that lots of stuff comes out. I'm getting surprises as I'm preparing these messages. I'm thinking, God, where did that come from? Where did that come from? That's new. I've not learned that before, because that's God's word. He wants to point things out new to us. But Amos, he must have really felt it, because he had to deliver these messages, and keep repeating these themes and to these people who were thick and just didn't get it. They didn't get it and that's how we are sometimes as Christians. We're thick, aren't we? We don't get it. I'm thick. Sometimes I don't get it. Sometimes God's got to go, say, Dave, get it. And when we get it, it's the most incredible thing. When we start embracing those, those changes God wants to make in our lives, we start breaking free. It's an incredible thing. It's an incredible thing. So they have to point this stuff out again and again. And he must have been saying to God, are you sure you want me to preach this stuff? I'm tired of it. It's weary. It's wearing me out. Let's see what he said. Let's have a look at what he said to the nation, to the people. Amos chapter 5, 18 to 27. Give you a couple of moments. Amos chapter 5, 18 to 27. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to be met by a bear. As though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have the snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark without a ray of brightness? I hate... I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll like a river. Righteousness like an ever-ending stream. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings forty years in the desert, O house of Israel? You have lifted up the shrine of your king, the pedestal of your idols, the star of your God, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is God Almighty. <coughs> Some really interesting stuff in there, and I was really surprised when, as I said, particularly on this message when I was preparing it, the stuff that came out. Uh, within this passage, the first thing that I noticed is that there was a truth that was circulating among God's people that had become a trap. There was a truth circulating among God's people that had become a trap. Now, for generations, Israel had been ravaged by war. They've been surrounded by lots of nations, and there've been lot of, lots of kickoffs, as they say in school, when you get down with the kids. 
They've been kicking off, you know, they've been having a bit of a fight. Uh, there have been lots of things happening like that, lots of wars, lots of conflicts. <coughs> there were certain promises that were given to the nation of Israel about how one day, ultimately, they were going to be delivered from all that conflict. They were going to be taken from that conflict. There were certain uh, 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 promises, prophecies, that all these attacks were going to be dealt with finally at some point by a personal visitation of God himself. And what, what had happened was, because of that promise that they clung to, that they held on to, because they, 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 they held on to this theme of the day of the Lord, because of that, uh, yeah, an unhealthy theme had developed within their public worship services, yeah? It was this constant theme of, oh, the day of the Lord's here, the day of the Lord's going to come, the day of the Lord. Every, every service, every meeting, every, every time they got together, every time they discussed stuff, we, uh, 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 it was all dominated by the theme of the day of the Lord. <coughs> and God's people had become trapped by a truth. They'd become stagnated and stuck in a rut, trapped by a truth. Three times in Amos, uh, he highlights this in, in verses uh, 18 to 20. This theme of, why do you say the day of the Lord? Why do you, the day of the Lord? Three times he mentions it. And what's interesting about this passage is that, as I said, this issue was not something, uh, it was, was not an issue or a theme that was uh, doctrinally incorrect. And what I mean by that, it, it, in terms of the Bible, it was, it was the right stuff that they were kind of get, getting their heads around. It wasn't... It wasn't an issue, doctrinally, that, that anyone would struggle with. It was, a, it was a right issue. There was, yeah, and there still is going to be a day of the Lord. Now, of course, we believe that Jesus came to suffer and die for the sins of the world. First coming. But there will be a day of the Lord, the second coming. Now, the problem with the Jews is that they believe that... The second coming, the, the kind of day of the Lord, the day when God conquered and vanquished everything, would happen when the first coming happened, you know, when Jesus came to suffer and die. So they kind of didn't see that the, the Messiah, Jesus, would have to die for the sins of the world and then he would come back again. Whereas we, that's what we believe. They, but they, they, doctrinally, they were right in that. At this time, they believed God was going to come and redeem them. He was going to come back and he was going to deal with the issues. He was going to, he was, he was going to come and he was going to help us as a nation to stop being attacked and hounded by other nations. It was a real truth. But what happened was it had become a single issue that dominated everything that people did. And you know, in our walk with Jesus and in, in our understanding of the Bible... I believe that as Christians, we can get into traps like this. You see, I believe that Satan can use a truth to trap us. And, and, and what happens is, when we think we've got truth, we become puffed up. We become proud. We start to become out of touch with what really God wants to do. And we become out of touch with what God wants to do through us. Now, I was at college with a lady who had been through a bad divorce, yeah, Bible college, she'd been through a bad divorce, and uh, she, her thing, her kind of truth that she clung on to was that after people have been divorced, they need divorce care, and she had a real heart for this, and, but the thing is, it was, it, 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 it was everything to her, you know, it was like, it was like her gospel, um, it was a single issue, that she talked about, you know, whenever you talked about an issue, you'd be talking about something completely different, and it'd be turned around to divorce care, which is a, it's a good issue, isn't it? Of course people need to be cared for after they've been through situations like that, but it was a single issue, and it dominated a whole walk with God. 
There was another lady who had a, a, a single issue. And her issue was women's ministry. She, 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 she was a massive advocate of women's ministry in the local church. Which we're, we're all an advocate of, aren't we? But she was just so into it. And everything that she talked about, uh, uh, everything that she did, every conversation you had with her was turned around to women's ministry. And to the point where she actually changed her name to Deborah. She changed her name to Deborah. Yeah, we know Deborah is like one of the most powerful women in the Bible, don't you? Like, like Deborah, you wouldn't want to come across Deborah, would you? My goodness, yeah, if you're a bloke like Deborah, oh, I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> but she, would, she changed the name to Deborah, and that was her thing. There were a family in, in Southport, in our hometown, that was so convinced that the second coming of Jesus was around the corner. Yeah? So convinced about that, they sold their family home and bought a yacht to take Jews back to Israel. They sold their family home and bought a yacht to take their Jews back to Israel. And never took a single Jew back in the yacht. Yeah? There was a well-known Bible teacher a few years ago who was convinced, really good Bible teacher, I'd heard him, fantastic, convinced that the Millennium Bug was going to bring down the computer systems and the economies of the world. He said it would happen in 2000 with the Millennium Bug. And 2000 came and 2000 went and the computers carried on running. All these people with all these different things, they all had truth, yeah? But sometimes in our walk with God, truth can, can send us off in a direction that's not helpful. It can send us off in a direction that's not helpful. And as believers, we've got to be in tune with stuff. We've got to be in tune with ourselves. We've got to be in tune with what's going on in the church. We've got to be in tune with all these issues. But we've got to watch that things don't become obsessive. And that's what happened in Israel. This theme, this obsession with the day of the Lord had become an unhealthy obsession for the people. Now the second thing we notice about this passage is that good, good, good religion did not make God relevant. In verses 22 and 23 of this passage we see the activity of God's people. These people were ultra-religious, ultra-religious. They, they celebrated all the feasts, you know, all the correct dates and all that kind of stuff. They brought the right offerings and the right sacrifices to the temple, all their grain offerings and all the different offerings. They brought them all into the temple. They had fantastic, great worship in the church. They had lo lots and lots of religious stuff but their meetings were a closed shop for members only. And the nation of Israel, that was supposed to be a nation that represented God's government on earth, that was supposed to be a beacon to all the surrounding nations around her, had become paranoid, over-defensive, and inward-looking. They had become selfish, as a nation and as a church, as any church in any generation, we all run the risk of becoming the same as this. And that's part of the reason why we put these banners out on the front because it's to kind of get our mindset focused on what we're supposed to be doing as a church. Now I don't know how we're going to do it, it's going to take time, it's going to be a process, but we are here for the people out there. We're here for the people out there. We look out and we reach out. That's why we put all our sermons on YouTube. Not so Dave would be on YouTube. Oh, Dave's on YouTube every week. Not, not, no, because everyone who preaches here will go on YouTube. The reason we did it was because we want to look out and we want to reach out. The reason we went on Twitter and Facebook and all these things, the reason we got a website was so we can look out and reach out. And these things are no way perfect. I'd like things to be a lot better, a lot slicker, all that kind of stuff. But we'll work on it and we'll improve it and we'll make it better and we'll make it better so that we can look out and we can reach out more. Now, 
I went to see Martin Wise, he's the headmaster of Hollyhead High School, last week, and I had a conversation with him, and it was great because God's timing is amazing, isn't it? And uh, he'd been in a meeting earlier on in the week, last week, where all the teachers from the area in Wales had been invited to this meeting. It was about spirituality in schools <coughs> and the need for spirituality in schools. And I went in to have a meeting with him about, uh, about kind of doing some assemblies and things like that because we want to get our youth work back up and running. And that was going to be a huge challenge and it scares, scares the life out of me. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, I had this meeting with him anyway and I was telling him about some of the issues we could talk into. You know, I was being a little bit guarded, a little bit careful, because that's the kind of generation we live in. You can't be too open uh, about these things. But, you know, I was really surprised. He said, he said well, what I'm looking for, Dave, is something a little bit more spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, yeah, come on, we're able to tell you about Jesus. You need to repent. You know, all this, let's turn your life over to God. Uh, but, you know, the, the upshot of that is that for the next four weeks, Monday and Tuesday, I'm doing all the assemblies in the, in the school. Oh, so we can, we can look to launch our youth work at the end of March. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't for a minute think that's going to be an easy thing to do, but I believe God's in it. I believe God's timing's perfect, and, you know, we're, we're very limited. I'm, I'm incredibly limited with my time, as you all know. But, you know, I believe God's favoured us. He's opened the door there, and it's thanks to the prayers here. You know, I'd encourage you to come to the prayer meeting on Thursday. It's down to the prayers here. It's down to your individual prayers. Nothing gets done without prayer, does it? So I just want to thank you, but we've got an opportunity there. And the reason we're doing that is because we want to look out and we want to reach out. We want to look out and we want to reach out to people's lives. We want, to, we want to show them that this church is all about Jesus Christ and what he can do for people personally. So we see from this passage that God was interested God, God wasn't interested in how good their religion was. He wasn't interested that they celebrated the right events at the right time. He, he wanted events that reached people. He wasn't interested that they were generous with their offerings, with their, the, the cattle and things that they brought in for the sacrifices at the temple at Bethel. He wanted offerings that would reach people. He wasn't interested that their music was far better than Hillsong or St. Paul's Cathedral. He wasn't interested in that. He wanted music that hit the streets and reached people. He want, yes, he wanted good religion. God always wants good religion. He wants us to be living right. Yeah? That's what religion is. Let's live right. Let's live for God. Yeah? He wants that. God wants that. But what he wanted above that was for people to be reached. For the nation to be a beacon, for the nation to be God's demonstration of government on earth. And that's what I love about Jesus, you know, that's what I love so much about Jesus and his teaching. You know, every time Jesus came in the, in the temple nearly, he got himself in trouble, didn't he? It's like turning over tables and, you know, healing men with shriveled hand, hands on the Sabbath day. And the, the Pharisees are like, you can't do that. And he's like, I can I can, but we see Jesus most of his time out in the street, don't we? Jesus in the boat. Jesus on the hillside. Jesus downtown. Jesus visiting people. Jesus at the dinner table with people that didn't know him. And maybe as Christians and as believers, we need to think about our dinner tables at home and who we have around them. Maybe we need to be thinking about reaching out to our neighbours and having a round of tea. Or inviting ourselves like Jesus did with Zacchaeus. He said, I'm coming around for tea. <laughs> Nothing you can do about it. I'm Jesus, I'm coming. <laughs> but we can do these things, you know. And um, it's all about reaching out, isn't it? It's about reaching out. Finally, we see that God's justice and righteousness were the thing that he was looking for. He wasn't looking for religion and doing stuff. He, 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 wanted, he wanted people living right. He wanted, he wanted people being treated justly. Because that's the kind of God we serve, isn't it? And as we see, God's righteousness and his justice were designed to spill out like a river. 
to spill out like a river that waters land. And that's why we read in verse 24, this amazing verse, it says, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. I love that verse. It's like one of those verses you first learn when you're a Christian, it's like, oh, you know, you feel that good saying it, don't you? Let justice roll like a river, righteousness like a, you know, it's not just, well, it was for me, it's one of those verses that I learned, you know, and I came across it again, and I was really encouraged by that verse, because it's like an amazing verse. We want justice to roll out like a river, don't we? As God's words preached it, as God's people are energised, as we start living for Jesus more fully, as we start thinking about how to engage with people out there, justice rolls out these doors like a river. Righteousness rolls out these doors like a never-ending stream. And I believe it with all my heart. I believe in the preached word of God. I believe there's nothing better to empower God's people and yeah, to man. understand this book. Yeah, I tell you, this book changed my life. Yeah, and I thank God for the day I read it. I thank God for the day I read it. I want to encourage you, get into God's word. Come on, let's be a church that knows God's word, that understands yeah, it, that we, when we don't cling to just one truth, but the whole truth of God's word, we start living it. We become living, breathing letters <laughs> from God. He's made us written epistles, bread of men. That's what, the, that's what we're to be, that's what the Bible says. We're to be, we're, we're written epistles, bread of men, by the way we live our lives, by our conduct, by our character, by who we are, by the passion within us. People see that, they want to taste a bit of that, they want it. Written epistles, bread of men, people will read your lives. And I want to tell you that if there's any area of conflict, or any area of lack of faith, or any area of kind of, where, you know, where you're under, under the foot of Satan. I want to tell you that people are going to see that. And it's time for this church to rise from under the foot of Satan. Amen. And I believe that, I believe we're there, but I believe, he, you know, from time to time, God, Satan can kick, try and get us back under. And he's remaining in that state of freedom, that state of freedom that Jesus bought for us on his cross. We've got to remain in that state of freedom. And I want to encourage you to remain in that state that state of freedom, so that in your life, justice rolls like a river. Righteousness rolls like a never-ending stream. I want to encourage you, come on, let's be passionate for our God. I want to tell you that people won't follow Jesus unless they see passion. I was watching a documentary about Bradford, and about making Bradford British last week. There's this Muslim down on his knee, on his mat in a car park, by a burger van. He's bowing like that and people are crying because they see his passion. It's misdirected passion. It's misdirected. It's not going to lead him to God. There's only one way to God and it's through Jesus and through his cross. And I want to tell you that that's the kind of passion that people in this generation are looking Amen. for. Amen. I, I tell you, people need to see passion. I want to encourage you to just get passionate for God. You know, I believe with all my heart that there's only one organisation on planet Earth that can bring about true righteousness in people. There's only one organisation on planet Earth that can get people living rightly. There's only one organisation on planet Earth that can bring true justice to people, and it's the local church. Sometimes we think we've got to go to a big meeting for God to show up. I want to say God's here every week in the local church. He loves his church. He died for his church. You see, when people turn to Jesus and start living right, they become carriers of justice. And I tell you, what we need in this church are new carriers of justice. We need people getting saved, friends. Amen. Sometimes we've been walking the road so long that it becomes so normal to us. And, and we lose that edge, that kind of radical edge. Uh, uh, but when people, fresh people, find Jesus for the first time, they're the greatest advert for the church. And I want to see more salvations. I want to see people finding Jesus. We need to reach people. We need to introduce them to how amazing Jesus is. So that they can become people who are on a pathway of living rightly and carrying justice. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to become a church that spills out justice and righteousness. 
but it's our choice. So let's not miss it. So we, we, we try new things this year. We pull together like we did yesterday on our Blitz Day. And I want to say when we pull together, we stop loving each other. We start talking to a few people we've not talked to for a few months. We start becoming a family again. We heal those old wounds. That our righteousness will shine before men. They will see our good works and they will glorify our Father in heaven. So I hope that's been an encouragement to you this morning. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your amazing, amazing passion. Passion that drove you to the cross. As we've considered these things this morning, Lord, help us in our personal lives and in our time to take time to spend with you. To bring our lives to you, to, Lord, have things corrected that have been left dormant for a long time. Lord, to bring correction so, Lord, your righteousness can become a torrent within the spirit of each person in here. That, Lord, justice can be a banner that is worn by each person in here. And that we would, Lord, go out there, we'd reach out, we'd tell people, we'd share the love of God with people. We pray for our youth work. We don't know what it's going to look like, we don't know what's going to happen. We're scared. We want to tell you, Lord, we're praying today, help us, Lord Jesus. Amen.